Okay, thank you. Um, I will talk uh, <coughs> um, in slightly less detail and also about contemporary examples, um, <coughs> rather more anecdotal, in the sense that uh, at least two of them are um, <coughs> examples uh, made by students of mine at the Experience Design Programme in CONSVAC. Um, <coughs> What I'm interested in, in general terms, uh, in this sort of conversation, is to think about uh, design, if you like, liberated from design products or design artifacts. Because increasingly, it seems to me, design is expanding its reach, its realm, its relevance in the world. And, for example, at recent uh, design thinking um, <coughs> workshops in uh, California, there were, I think, 200 people present. Not a single one is a designer. So design thinking is this brainstorming technique that allows you to think associatively and to sort of create a, uh, to unpack a concept or a, or a brief in all sorts of um, unpredictable and creative ways. And people are recognizing decision makers, business leaders, people in terms of in charge of social organi organizations are recognizing this as a very powerful methodology that allows them to escape the uh, routines and habits that they've got into in their own background. So more and more people are recognizing the importance of design uh, when lifted from the what we'd conventionally think of as design um, activity, uh, such as a background in industrial design and so on. Um, Maria mentioned that I'm uh, <coughs> working at CONSFAC and there I've partly joined CONSFAC to set up uh, four years ago now a new master's program in experience design. And this is, I think, a good example of, of this paradigm that I'm trying to describe because experience design uh, takes um, uh, <coughs> the conventional design disciplines. Sorry, experience design is dedicated to the design of experience over time. So it works with intangibles supported by intangibles, things you can't see, touch, um, but it's supported by the conventional design disciplines such as industrial design, graphic design, uh, architecture and so on. And what I would like to talk about today is uh, a, um, a series of examples in which uh, transdisciplinary initiatives are taking place, uh, meaning people are working between different discipline, disciplinary backgrounds. They are creating new teams, if you like, new design teams. Design is a very good model for this way of working, bringing people together from very different backgrounds and finding out ways in which they can work together to address a common problem or theme. Uh, I won't go into this in, in detail because it's more sort of <laughs> maybe more interesting for institutions than individuals, but some of the uh, <coughs> key terms here are to look at the logic of networks, for example. This, I think with your generation, would be this will be second nature to you, but for some of us, this is a quite significant shift from uh, previous ways of working. To look at borders, distinctions, um, uh, how to create protocols and make connections, how to see connections. Um, I come from a literature background and I think the value of that education in, in my case is it's made me very good at seeing connections or very interested in seeing connections between things. That's how poetry works, for example, by, by creating connections. Um, looking for different forms of action, relevance, ways of applying design where design would not conventionally be thought of. For example, one of the examples <coughs> I'll give you is design applied to conflict resolution. How do you solve conflicts? Can design have a role in doing them? Uh, looking for uh, innovation, entrepreneurship in the sense of making connections, uh, not being um, ideological and measuring impact according to the logic of the, of the um, particular situation. So, <clears throat> for example, uh, experience design, we ask the question, can experience design be used to make an improvement in patient recovery time inside uh, a cancer ward? Um, <clears throat> and you could say, so what? You know, architects, interior designers, many designers have been involved in that sort of question. But the difference was, we said, let us not measure this by the criteria of art design, which we say, 
you know, we painted it a different colour, everyone feels more relaxed, we've done a good job. Let us instead measure it by the, imp by the metrics of the uh, professionals themselves. So it has to be provable medically that design has made an impact for us to claim a success story. The point here, this is um, uh, an essay that I would recommend. It's available online as a PDF, and it's been a very strong influence on experience design as we've developed it. Jack Burnham, 1968. And he's describing an important transition here. He says, increasingly products, either in art or life, become irrelevant, and a different set of needs arise. These revolve around such concerns as maintaining the biological livability of the earth, producing more accurate models of social interaction, um, understanding the growing symbiosis in man-machine relationships, establishing priorities for the usage and conservation of natural resources, and defining alternative patterns of education, productivity, and leisure. Very much ahead of his time. Um, in the past, our technologically conceived artifacts structured living patterns. We are now in transition from an object-oriented to a systems-oriented culture. Here, change emanates not from things, but from the way things are done. So, if you like, what he's describing here is a movement from objects to information, and not just information, but also um, <coughs> processes, as Maria was talking about. Processes, forms of interaction, um, methods, the production of methods. And design is, uh, um, I think, increasingly associated with designing methods. Design thinking is one such example of that. So this is the notion of, before I get to design itself, uh, the notion of transdisciplinarity as an open system. Um, <clears throat> and this is uh, a biologist, Ludwig von Bertalanffy, describing an open system. He says, the organism is not a static system closed to the outside and always containing the identical components. It is an open system in a quasi-steady state maintained constant of its mass relations in a continuous change of component material and energies, in which material continually enters from and leaves into the outside environment. So uh, an open system means that you're pragmatic, you're, as a designer, you're, you're constantly open to looking for other uh, perspectives, other insights that will extend and improve the uh, execution of your design work. Uh, the danger of disciplines, it seems to me, is that people close them off. They become specialists, and then they only talk to fellow specialists. And they, you know, they get blinkers on, and um, very quickly you get involved in all sorts of uh, uh, um, practices and habits that simply reinforce your specialisation, as opposed to talking to people and finding out what is needed. And that's the sort of idea of the open system. This is a fancy word which we don't have to get worried about, but transverse epistemologies means that you are const you're, the way that you evaluate a particular form of knowledge is constantly shifting because you don't have a single stable ground on which to stand. If you have a, a team that consists, a design team that consists of sociologists, sports psychology experts, uh, industrial designers, um, did I say psychologists? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> architects, etc., uh, etc. Et <clears throat> Where is the ground by which we evaluate the, the design? Because these are many partial different uh, um, epistemological grounds. So this idea of being flexible and to be able to sort of think of a system comprised of many different elements is one I want to uh, highlight. And I'll give you examples very soon now, but uh, just to give you an Id idea of the sort of themes that we work with in experience design, we believe in themes rather than disciplines, and our, the way that we approach themes are typically speculative, oriented towards thinking about the future. So these are actually studios that we've run so far, and research projects we've been involved in. Uh, the future, what is the future of play? Uh, meaning, for whom might play be uh, an important principle in Swedish society in 10, 20, 30 years? Who is completely uninterested in play right now? Examples from America would be the American Army, which I think the biggest producer of uh, games right now in the United States. Uh, surgeons have um, discovered that they can warm up for an operation by, by using Game Boy and uh, whatever it's called. <laughs> Not only warming up, I mean, Nintendo surgeons, they are really 
I mean, doing surgery at, on a distance through yeah. these devices. Exactly. So it's so like hand eye coordination. They've actually also developed gamers yeah. specifically for that. Mm. Um, aging, uh, security, talent, design, future design. Uh, one of my examples will address that. And dying, uh, palliative care, we have been working with recently, and I have also an example on that subject. And then Opera is a recent uh, interesting one. We did a studio on Opera in the reactor hall under KTH, where they used to have the nuclear reactor, and now it's a big empty performance space. And that was connected to New York City Opera. And the, the brief we were given then was by the director of New York City Opera, uh, George Steele, was uh, Given the economics of opera, it is unsustainable as a form. <clears throat> fewer and fewer people are going, and it requires a huge infrastructure to deliver opera to those that do enjoy opera. So can you speculate and deliver as the future of the experience of opera? In other words, what might be other delivery systems of the experience of opera? without necessarily involving large orchestras, you know, expensive scenery, large casts of characters, and so on. So our experience design students got to work on speculating on the, delivering the experience of opera in the future. Sure enough, um, George Steele's ahead of the game because uh, the New York City Opera, where he's uh, based, uh, went bust during the course of that course. <laughs> so it's actually a, a very real um, uh, problem that's facing opera. And it's interesting because architects, for example, often fantasize about the opera building as being the ultimate you know, <laughs> expression of architectural expertise, and yet we're building these things for a form that is becoming obsolete. Uh, okay, I have two examples from the art world before we get to the world of design, because I'm also interested in this sort of connection between the two. Um, my first one is uh, Hans Hacke, Hans Hacke. Um, which is uh, from 1972, it's the Rhine Water Purification Plant. <clears throat> and I mention this because it's an example of what I've been talking about. It's interdisciplinary, it's scalable, uh, it's socially engaged, and um, it's both art and it's grey water reclamation. Basically what uh, was going on here was the, the authorities around the River Rhine said the, the River Rhine is polluted and it cannot be, it's scientifically impossible to uh, purify the water. Therefore, we can't invest money in this because it's impossible to cure it of the pollution. Hans Hacker said, oh no, it's not, and he made a DIY purification plant, homemade, you know, he had his own filtration system here. The river Rhine is going past the gallery on the outside here, so he siphons off water through his homemade purification bottles and tanks, feeds it into this glass, uh, construction puts fish in to demonstrate, to make visible that the water is purified and can sustain fish life, and then feeds it back into the river Rhine here. So it's literally an intervention in, uh, in the uh, polluted river. And in doing that, he demonstrates to the public and to the political authorities that it is indeed possible to purify the water. If it can be done on this homemade scale, it can be done on a large scale. What is lacking is the political will to do so, to invest the money to do so. So it's propaganda, you could say. It's, a, it's political uh, intervention. It's an artwork. It's design. And it's also uh, environmental science. It's great water reclamation. And this, I think, is an example of, the, of this sort of interdisciplinary or even transdisciplinary way of thinking because it's doing more than one thing at once. You know, it's paying off different constituencies. Um, next example, also from the, the art world, is a student from CONSFAC, uh, somebody with whom I've been talking for some years because we're both interested in the, the metaphor of the hybrid. This is Linda Sharma Östrand, who has a Palestinian father and a Swedish mother, and she's been interested in questions of hybrid identity for, uh, for some years. She created a uh, sculpture outside, a roundabout outside CONSFAC, which is partly an elk symbol of Sweden and partly a camel, symbol of Palestine. But this I think is far more interesting because for her master's thesis work she actually created a new species of frog. <coughs> and she also kept a diary about you know, her feelings about doing this, the challenge of doing this scientifically, what she had to learn, but also her own reflections about her own identity as she grappled with these quite complex issues of hybrid identity. 
So this frog has literally never existed before. She created it. And as you know, the, there was a, a large uh, media storm at Consvac a couple of years ago when um, Anna Odell faked uh, suicide and was taken into... Do you remember this story? Yeah. Two or three years ago? Was taken into the um, uh, psychiatric unit and then revealed that this is an art project and everybody got very angry and took positions. Uh, I think the newspapers came uh, last year looking for another scandal and completely missed this, which I think is far more <laughs> controversial and powerful as a story. It's an artist playing God, in effect. They completely missed it because it required a different set of uh, uh, reading, I think. What was interesting also about this was that part of the exhibition was in Consfac, but the frog itself was at the Natural History Museum in uh, Stockholm at the same time. So she was... Uh, also physically connecting institutions in her work. Um, <clears throat> and now on to the design world, um, if we can make this separation. I, I'm sorry I don't have more or better images of this, but this is a, a couple, uh, one of whom is based in Stockholm, Reed Kram, and Clemens Weisheimer is based in Berlin. Um, and they are, uh, I think, very interesting contemporary designers because they've done uh, a number of projects which are, <clears throat> I would say, connecting different industrial periods to ask very relevant questions about the role of contemporary design. Um, <clears throat> the first one I'll just have to tell you about, and you, can, you can search for it online, uh, but it's because um, last night I didn't have the internet, so I couldn't get the images I was looking for. Uh, but the first one is a project called Breeding Tables. And the question there is, what would it be to, to mass produce the original art object? That's one question. And the more interesting question is, what is the role of the designer and her connection to originality in the 21st century when India and China are coming online and giving away design, giving away originality. So the very basis on which people like yourselves are trained, uh, in other words, develop a distinctive style, your signature style, uh, be better than everyone else and promote yourself, you will, in other words, uh, succeed or fail on the basis of a paradigm of originality. They were saying this is totally out of, out of date uh, because you know, the world has changed and originality can be given away for free. So they actually made, um, they, they created an algorithm which allowed, which was connected to a laser cutting uh, technology which allowed them to <coughs> mass produce um, uh, very beautiful tables, each one of which was totally unique. And they, they bred, it's an evolutionary algorithm, so they, they would breed a thousand uh, versions of this delete 999, you know, keep five of them and then let them breed over time. The algorithm would sort of evolve over time. And then they would uh, connect it to the um, industrial hardware and start mass producing these tables. And it's, that table is an object, it's a beautiful object, it's a fine example of table making. I'm sorry, I don't know the slide of it here. Uh, but it's also, um, as Maria said in her examples, it's also a model of an economic system. There's one outside the Design Museum in London, for example. It's a model of a changed relationship to the conditions of the economic production of design. This rather poor slide is their most recent project called Outrace. And I'll just mention it very briefly. They took the uh, automotive robots from Audi. These are robots that would, until a few months ago, were used to make Audi motor cars. You know, from the industrial period. And they connected it to the internet and to anyone, uh, uh, and to um, slow motion photography and uh, um, light emitting, uh, <coughs> uh, they put lights on the robotic arms. Again, this is online, so you can see these things in action, but it, it meant that anyone could send a text to Trafalgar Square to these robots, and the uh, robots would select certain texts and they would spell them out in the sky. It had to be 14 characters. Uh, they would write them in the sky and the slow motion camera would capture it. So they were, they were robots created for making um, uh, motor cars from the industrial age that were then recontextualized and became uh, information age robots that were now 
carving messages, intangible messages in the sky that were momentarily there and then replaced by the next message. And again, that's, I think, a, an interesting way of thinking of using the logics between different industrial periods, you know, industrial age, the information age in that case. And my third example from them, uh, which is one that I was involved in, is uh, connected to the porcelain manufacturing company at Niffenberg uh, in Germany, who have been going since 1759 producing these very high-end, very beautiful uh, porcelain figures uh, around the Commedia dell'arte figures. They made them originally for kings and queens and the aristocracy, a very exclusive objects. And they were looking at how could they keep this craft technique alive in the 21st century. What would it take to keep their workers there, keeping this um, uh, very specialised uh, and very sort of narrow range of skills alive? Uh, how could they bring this traditional craft industry into the 21st century? So they commissioned Reed and Clemens and also Florian Boehm, the photographer, to work on this. What they came up with was a very interesting system, I think because they commissioned, first of all, a set of uh, fashion designers like Victor and Rolf, Vivian Westwood, um, Frank Sorbia, Christian Lacroix, and so on, to redress, to redesign the clothes for the Commedia dell'arte figures. So they started cross-breeding the world of fashion with the world of craft, then, these traditional 18th century figures, then re-clothed by contemporary high... Uh, Haute couture, high-end fashion designs. These are some of the moulds used to create the figures. Here you can see how you know, exquisitely uh, detailed these sort of figures are. And then you see them being redressed by these designers. Why are they doing this? They're doing this as a sort of branding exercise, in effect. They're looking at uh, you know, bringing this company into the um, media glare of the 21st century. And what better way to do that than by using the uh, celebrity status of high-end fashion designers. So this was the first step. They had them uh, repainted, re rethought. Um, you could compare them, the different uh, interpretations of these traditional Commedia dell'arte figures. Um, Again, very exclusive collectible sets. These were sold uh, extremely expensive. There was only a limited number, so they were art objects. And this is also an interesting aspect, it's from craft to art and also involving design, as we'll see. Um, they also had uh, events, exhibitions. Um, there's Vivian Westwood, hero from my punk days, <laughs> way back then in the days before the Walkman. <laughs> uh, they had an exhibition, this is at the actual Wittenberg uh, foundry itself in Germany. Exhibition again designed by uh, um, Florian Böhm, the, the art photographer, and uh, Reed and Clemens. His phot photographs became part of the collection of the... Uh, um, so it became a sort of media event and also there was this, and this is where I was involved, there was this uh, book that came out in several editions. One was a very expensive collector's book, part of a box set that only uh, very wealthy people could afford. And then there were sort of different iterations of it down to a book that you can buy in a, in a common bookshop. Um, so it was operating on a number of different levels and <coughs> um, it successfully brought this uh, traditional craft company into all the magazines, all the glossy magazines, Vogue and um, all the rest of them. And what it did, and the reason I mention it as an example, is it revitalized economically an area. You know, it used design, the project brought in the skills of the designer to connect craft, art and design to high-end haute couture, you know, high-end fashion, to media. And the purpose of all this was an economic purpose. It was to revitalize the the area economically and also to retain the traditional skills and make them relevant for a new audience. Some more examples from the book. Uh, my second example is from one of my students which is a quite different example. Um, it's asking this question, can art 
and design helped resolve the problem. So Johannes Tolk was the experience design student, master's student. Uh, he's a graphic designer, <coughs> and this is an example of what happens when somebody comes from a field like graphic design, uh, goes into experience design and starts working in, in, a, in a different way, because he really wanted to address this question, can art and design help to resolve conflicts? And we said, okay, well don't talk about it, do it. So to our surprise he did, he disappeared for a while, <laughs> and he came back with a specific site and said, you know, in Bulgaria, the Roma community have been excluded from all public uh, services, discourse, they're literally walled off, they're also symbolically walled off. So I'm going to investigate, you know, how I can sort of symbolically break down that wall. Um, and what's interesting there was he, the strategy he used was to get to decision makers. You know, they, they did this workshop. They produced, they had a lot of discussions and uh, what would diversity taste like if we could think of that concept, would there be a taste? And they used food, something that unites everybody from all different backgrounds. They used food as their design material to think through that question. And they came up with a chocolate. And for some artists and designers, they would stop there. They would put a nice wrapping around it. They would say, isn't this cool? I've made a chocolate that symbolizes diversity. You know? But he use that as an agent within a bigger system and that's where I think it becomes more more closer to the experience design way of thinking because those chocolates were simply a means to get access to the decision makers, the mayor, the minister of education and so on and that allowed them permission to start operating on the site to have a dialogue with the Roma community for them to do portraits of each other uh, so I should be clicking through this as I go, here's the team <laughs> for them to do a second workshop, this was the site, very grim and depressing place for them to start working and do portraits of each other and to share sort of representations of each other and thereby not only literally but also symbolically to start taking away parts of this wall so it becomes a symbol for diversity rather than a separation, a uh, symbol of separation. <coughs> um, leading to, it doesn't solve, I, I was, the only other time I presented this, some in the audience was really, got very provoked and said, how can you claim that this is solving a 700 year old uh, problem, you know, this is outrageous, and I'm not claiming that at all, it's, it's, it obviously hasn't solved the problem, the realities of economic difference and deprivation are maintained, however, what has changed is that there's a step towards involving the community in the conversation around them, rather than having them talked about the now 
one step towards um, participating in their own role within that uh, society. <clears throat> so again, this point that change emanates, uh, this is Jack Burnham again, um, change emanates not from things, but from the way things are done. And my third and last example is, I think, uh, a, um, an example of that. This is, again, a, an experienced design student, Stina Westman. Um, now we are working with palliative care. It took us about a year to set up this collaboration because it's a very sensitive one. <coughs> palliative care is where people go typically to uh, uh, people with um, terminal conditions to spend the last, on average, 17 days, 15, 17 days of their life. And this was a collaboration we set up with uh, Karolinska, um, <coughs> Carol Tishman, uh, Professor of Nursing there, and also Axel Gordon in Umil, another palliative care centre. Um, and the question was this, can we use experience design to improve the quality of life for those final days? Not only for the patients, or the guests as they're called, um, but also for the carers and for the visiting families. Those are the three uh, um, <clears throat> parties we wanted to try to make a difference for. Uh, the people that worked there, the people that were staying there and spending their last days of life, and the visiting family um, in that site. Um, <clears throat> and the example that I will present you is uh, from Stina Lesman. She um, she had, it was a difficult project for her because she had lost her mother relatively recently and so she had first-hand experience of going through this process of, um, of grieving and, and being with a parent in, the, in their last days of life. So she was not sure that she could do it but in the end she got very determined to do it and was very happy that she continued with it because it became something she invested a lot of her own sort of uh, emotional energy into uh, as well as her design skill. What she identified was a particular moment in, um, <clears throat> in the uh, home where family, families would visit and the children, or often the grandchildren of the patient, would get very bored because typically the patient is in bed, uh, it's conversation, and for small children it's very boring. They, they want activity and things to do. There's nothing for them to do. Everyone, all the adults are very serious and often sad and unhappy. There's not much for the child to do. At the same time, um, <clears throat> the patients are very happy uh, to see their grandchildren, of course. So she was thinking, how can I support that moment, that visiting moment, to try to create an interface or uh, a different type of experience for the uh, parts? And what she came up with was the idea of a blanket book. This is a book that you can, <clears throat> um, if the patient chooses, you would replace a blanket with this blanket, which consists of five different layers. Um, each of which supports a different activity. So there could be, this is an early prototype, the final version is a little bit different, but there could be, for example, a, uh, a poem or a story on the first page that would you know, allow them to, a uh, grandchild and <coughs> grandparent to read together or to discuss what its topics it's raising, maybe about the finitude of life and, um, or about memory or you know, love or whatever topic. There was also uh, little pockets where messages could be left for the child, or the child could leave drawings prepared. There could be sweets in there, and the child would put a hand in and look for them, and you know, there would also be uh, hand contact, which is also very important there to, to uh, break that down. It's playful. Um, <clears throat> there were other sheets that had um, uh, different forms of activities, which I think we'll see in a moment. But the process is what was interesting here, because it, it was ethically a very challenging project, because um, uh, we were not allowed to work with dying patients uh, for understandable reasons. Um, <clears throat> so the question then is, for a designer, how do you prototype, how do you develop a design if, you don't, if you're not able to talk to people for whom you're designing, at least part of the, uh, the group for whom you're designing? And what Stina did was to go into a dog's and um, to say to the children, you are my experts, and c can you help me with my design problem? Um, <clears throat> I want you to imagine that you've got a friend who uh, can't get out of bed. 
you know, maybe she's got a broken leg or something, but she's in bed. How are you going to play with a friend that can't get out of bed? And she had a box of all sorts of things that they could use, you know. They had also things they could wear to change roles and so on. So here's Dina working with them. Um, they're children, they love playing, they do this naturally, and they got to work on finding ways in which they could play with this person who was standing in for the dying patient uh, and came up with all sorts of uh, very smart ideas. Uh, at this, at, after that workshop, Stina went up to Axel Gordon and spoke with the uh, uh, staff there and said, um, <clears throat> use a series of uh, exercises to find out about their relationship to their work because what we discovered was that they're very multi-skilled. You know, they're, they're being employed and they're being paid as carers, but in fact they combine the roles of uh, often as priests, of poets, of philosophers, as um, you know, a, a whole range, whole range of different skills are in play there. So they were asked to uh, identify the values, what they would want to have in their workplace. They had uh, this exercise, which. Um, Stina got from the company IDEO, you might have heard of them, they, she had an internship there. And in this exercise everybody is given a sort of Spencer dog on a newspaper with a blank sheet in between and you're asked to produce a headline for one year's time, what would be your ideal headline? Newspaper headline for your workplace. So they have things like 100 meters queue for two jobs at Axel Gordon. <laughs> yeah. um, all the relatives were partying all, all weekends when they went there. They were just, you know, speculative sort of fantasies about what they might like to see happen. Um, brainstorming techniques. Uh, and then they were also asked to list activities, the sort of activities that occur when families visit. So conversations, singing, fika, playing games. And then what artefacts are needed to support that, like a chair and so on. So that she was gathering information in, in the, all these parts. And then the next day she did a thing which we were very, very keen on called experience prototyping. And the idea behind that, again, it's, it's developed by IDO, but I think we've taken it a stage further. The general idea is that the designer goes from the third person to the first person. So instead of being on the outside looking in, you, become, you experience your design, you're on the inside, and you prototype it through uh, role play and so on. So here you see the blanket book, I'm being the patient, this is my playing the role of my granddaughter, and this is Stina being, playing the role of, of my daughter visiting, and we're going through these different activities. Um, and then again, to make this quite vivid, <laughs> the third person to the first person, here's Stina, in now as the patient experience in the blanket book itself. This is the professor of nursing playing a seven-year-old child uh, from Axel Gordon, Birgitta. And um, this was refined over, over, over some time. It was felt to be too heavy, it was too warm at certain times. She changed the activities on the inside. And, uh, <coughs> Uh, and now here she is with uh, an actual patient. With the, the the book is actually uh, the blanket book is now going into further development. She's graduated, and it's been caused an enormous amount of interest amongst the palliative care homes. Not only for this particular artifact itself, and Stina is an industrial designer by training, but through going through experience design, she's brought in all these other methods and has a. Um, <coughs> Uh, a wider range and is now thinking of specialising in these sort of uh, interventions in that particular setting. So I'll finish now. Um, and uh, I don't think we need to go to this session. Uh, it's just about transdisciplinarity. We can skip that. I'll finish there. <laughs> um, the point, I think, in each case is the. Um, <clears throat> Uh, the question about, as designers, where do you set the limits, the boundaries of your practice? You know, do you say, I'm a designer, therefore I'm this? I think a, a lot of problems occur from people being deeply rooted in questions of identity. And <coughs> therefore they get fragile and they can break because they root a lot of their sense of self and self-worth in 
questions of identity, which happen so easily and all the time, they're you know, always forming around us. Uh, and if you create a more sort of porous boundary, as it were, it seems to me you open up degrees of freedom for other ways of acting and being and interacting with others. Um, and my examples, I've chosen them because they are attempts to show what happens when a designer, yes, is, is T-shaped, you know, shaped like that, yes, deeply rooted in a practice, can do design really well, has got years of experience of doing that, but is also horizontal, is able to move across different fields. That's not to say they have to be specialists in sociology or nursing or anything else, but they need to be uh, systems thinkers that know how to work with teams like that. So they know how to first of all identify their knowledge needs and then um, <clears throat> enable them to uh, productively collaborate. And that's my understanding of the contemporary designer now, increasingly as somebody that has those uh, <clears throat> multiple skills and in that sense is, and here's the good news, is a very, uh, arguably one of the most powerful models of expertise for the world that we face in 2011 onwards. That's the good news. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Rob. I think that was a brilliant uh, introduction also to, to this week's reading. You managed to, to tap into all the themes that we will bring up tomorrow. Um, both this idea of, of expanding design uh, into something that, that embraces life in general and in a com very complex way, and also uh, secondly, uh, the idea of design thinking as a skill. What is it? What, what can it do? What is it good for? And thirdly, also this difficulty of actually having different roles and different competences. The designer with his or her competence also bringing in other experiences, the users so-called. How do we do that? How do we deal with that? And um, what uh, can that bring in terms of, uh, uh, of uh, yeah, making design into something valuable and, and meaningful? Do you have any questions? Do we have um, half an hour for discussions? <coughs> something that you thought of or wanted to ask? Or? Something that was unclean, <laughs> or just uh, perhaps you have um, examples that you come across that you think is good or bad. I have a question to your example with the Walkman. Yeah. What do you think is the difference between the Walkman and then you have all those MP3 players that you can hook up to, in, to the internet and? Uh, they are more popular with social yeah. media. Yeah. Or, I mean, we that <laughs> precisely, we have them, all, all of us. We don't. It's almost like we we don't consider them. Well, it's not true, but to a certain extent, they're not objects at all anymore. They are completely changeable. I mean, we 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 use them for a while, and then we we get a new one. It's not. It's not in the same way connected to this personal development of ours or to the, to the production of identity to a certain extent. On the other hand, I think it's still very much the same that many people attach to their iPhone or their gadget as part of almost like a prosthesis, a kind of extension of themselves. You know? So it's, it's, it's kind of, we're, we're in in the kind of transition period, I think, very much, where we, on the one hand, we talk, we're talking very much about uh, forms and objects um, dissolving into services and uh, experiences, and on the other hand, we're still very much uh, tied up with this material world. 
and also in terms of using resources and energy. I mean, it's very much a problem. <laughs> I don't know. What do you think? And well, Peter yeah. Anderson is a, a is a design researcher uh, here. So I mean, if you have questions to a researcher, you can also ask them questions. So what do you think, Anders? No, I, I work mainly with sound. So, <laughs> but uh, what I think is the difference between the Walkman. And uh, those things that are hooked up to the internet is really that it's not only a personal thing anymore, but it's more of a shared thing. And uh, also, you, of course, you you do you play your own playlists, and you, but you do. I'm also on uh, twittering and on Facebook, so it's turned into something else and not personalized uh, soundtrack for our lives. Right, even though he, the guy walking around with, with his Walkman, he, although he was in his bubble very much, and that has changed, but he was also connecting to a kind of global youth culture. Uh, but this has taken another step today. You're always connected to your tribe, so to speak, through the net. Uh, yes, Joko. Yeah. I'm disagree, of course. Uh, um, it's just it's just a, a new form for the same function. Um, these new players have become cheaper in relation. Those uh, early cassette players uh, were really expensive. So in my family there was one, and that was a big problem uh, because it was so expensive. Today you just go whatever. Bulluf Center and you buy some of them for some change. It's not that much of an investment in, uh, if you just want to have an MP3 player or something. But the core problem is the same. You've got some pre-produced music, you're going to listen to that, and it's just the rate of exchange of their tracks. There is nothing truly personal in this pre-produced stuff. It's, it's like buying a car and screwing stuff to it to make it personal. This is my Golf Volkswagen. Excuse me, how many million of these cars are out there and have the same personalized um, surface? It's like your iPhone with the exchangeable outer. Yeah? It's nothing really personal. The rest is happening on the mind and, and that is not on the object or in the object, it's, it's additional layers of emotion and so on. And I think that has not changed. I remember the stories about the first Volkswagen Beetle turning up. And it was um, like exactly like, like you said about the, 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 the Walkman. It was the dream of mobility, of personal mobility come true for those who somehow got one of those machines. Yeah, so we will find examples for every generation, I guess, with some other tool or totem or whatever you want to label this. But the, the core problem is more fundamental, I think. This is a mass marketing society, and what is true personal personality in there? Uh, there is an there are industries that pre-produce whatever emotions, experiences, uh, and so on for the mass consumption, and you would only break out of that mold by singing yourself, possibly. Yeah, stuff like that. But as soon as you start to sing on the whatever, the bus and so on, you might get into trouble again because it does not fit the the, the, the environment anymore. Anymore. So I think that is the, 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 the real problem behind this. And the rest is just different packages for the same function. But then I'm quite negative here, I know that. <laughs> but we need, we need you as a kind of counterpoint as well. I think, yeah, but this is the, the critical uh, issue. Also, you can generalize it and say that design is about how to connect the individual to society or how to make the link between the specific and the general. That, the, that is the, the core um, task of design or a designer. And that is politically extremely problematic. You can do it in many different ways. And it's always about power 
it's always about uh, dependency, about, uh, yeah, uh, to a certain extent about limitation of individual freedom. So it's, it's very good that you bring this up in this very clear way. We have one comment here. Um, yes, yeah. I, I feel like it's this, the Walkman is more like the object is desirable and now it's turned into that the use of it is the, the thing <laughs> not not the object because it's so it's cheaper it's common it's you have it ev everywhere yeah so do you, you feel that transition yeah. towards use and kind of um, but yeah. but on the other hand it's always been like that because it's a part of the, the modern culture and I guess the chance to make the money out of every new uh, new uh, gadget it's it's not as easy as it was I guess as we we know uh, or as the designers of Sony Ericsson no, <laughs> but it's not as easy as no, as because it it's so be. you have it everywhere, so it's yeah. more the use of it. Right. That's yeah, precisely. Yeah, that's very true. So, Sony Ericsson have given up on <coughs> making uh, handsets because they know they they're actually losing money on that. They're, yeah. they're not getting money out of that. Uh, they've been in touch with it, and they say, you know, what is it? What is our business then? And the conclusion is experience and connectivity. As a, and the, the handset is simply a, an agent within that larger sort of team. I think it's the same with the, the iPod as well. That, um, I was thinking when I saw your film of the Sony Walkman advert, you know, uh, there, I just read this week there is in courts now an expression called iPod Oblivion when there's car accidents or pedestrians or cyclists are hit by cars. You know, that's one thing I take into account. This iPod, iPod oblivion involved, meaning uh, you know you're, you're not switched present. off to your yeah. world like he was, you know, because you're, you're tuned into this. Mm -hmm. But the um, there's a very big difference between an iPod and an iPhone. I think the iPhone is more of a sort of system, <laughs> one bit of which is, is an iPod. Um, but I think it, it's coming back to this question about power. I'm not sure if I agree that sort of designers always connected to power in that same instrumental sense because for example you take the perspective of an object an example like the <clears throat> the iPod you could say for the user it allows them the illusion of aestheticizing their world by providing a different soundtrack as they walk through the city you know? and I remember that very clearly the first time I used a walkman you know it's like wow I, you know my everyday life has become a, mu a movie scene because I've got the soundtrack here. <laughs> um, but from the side of the producer, Apple, uh, they had a very different question. Um, and actually, industrial designers hate hearing this, <laughs> but I, I enjoy beating the story. Ronald Jones, the person I work with on experience design, his friends were one of the people that were in the room with Stephen Jobs when Stephen Jobs came and started the process that led to the iPod. And he said, what happened was this. Stephen Jobs didn't walk into that room and say, OK, everyone, what cool new gadgets can we make that will bring us a lot of money? He didn't ask that question. He asked a different question. He said, how can we take over the music industry? You know, that was the, that was the task. And they, towards that end, they came up with a whole system. The iPod is just one element within that system. The contracts, the record companies, iTunes, you know, all these other, the, the, the software, and everything that locks you into that of all elements within that, changing the music industry from shops with CDs to computers with download services. And that, that is, uh, of course, power. Very, very much power. <laughs> very naked ex exhibition of power in terms of let's take out this entire industry. You could say they're doing that with the iPhone as well, but much wider than The iPad is dedicated to taking, taking over the publishing industry, quite, quite obviously. Yeah. So, so there's that example which would support the you know, designer's power, I think, but, but in a sense this is industrial design on steroids, or industrial design combined with experience design and various other things to produce certain capitalistic sort of intentions. But you can also say that there's another application of design which is uh, a form of social entrepreneurship, 
or to do with you know interventions or and it doesn't have that same yes it's power but it's power in a, in a sort of uh, progressive form you know, uh, uh, <clears throat> supportive sense um, and in that sense I would make an analogy between design and research that I think are quite closely aligned design and research share a common ambition uh, which is change to bring about change they want to be the difference that makes the difference so you have a situation you add design or you add research or best of all you add design research <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and you know the situation has changed by the addition of those elements. And then I think it's not automatic that it's connected in a negative sense to to question to, to, to power. In that way. No, but uh, I mean this this transition also includes the fact that power as, as such has changed from something that is uh, connected to, uh, for example, a person or a place or building or an institution to something that is more spread out in, to, in society as a network. And I think it's also very important to, to um, remember the fact that, uh, that there is a difference between problem solving and design. Problem solving is about fixing the system very much on the, the conditions of the system. Whereas Design is about creating new potentials. And potentials, potentials, it's the same, it's a synonym of power, potentia. That means power in Latin. So I think that distinction is very important. Design is future looking and it expands our possibilities of acting. Whereas problem solving is accepting the system and make it work somehow. Mm. More comments? We have ended on a very high level of, of talking uh, power politics. Power so politics, when yes. You, when, you, when, you, when you think <laughs> about whatever uh, redesigning some tools like an X, you're not thinking about changing uh, the distribution of power in something. So I think the, the everyday life of most designers is not about questioning uh, the power structures, but to um, provide good stuff to work with. That is the everyday life of most designers I know. <laughs> Few yes. get the chance to, yeah. to do the, the big game. But again, I mean, that is everyday life, but everyday life is actually operating or happening on many levels at the same time. So while you are doing something that you might think is very trivial, it may have an effect. And I think we have some really good examples very close by. We have in this building, Mons Adler, who has developed Bambooser, uh, that's an application uh, for streaming video. Uh, he's actually often done in the factory, and he, he's also related to Medea, to the research institute at K3. Uh, Bambooser was used very much during the uprising in Cairo, and had all of a sudden, I mean, a very direct effect on the very system, even though it was a trivial gadget that you were supposed to play around with. So that could happen, and I think it happens more easily if you somehow take this into consideration while designing and while trying to understand what design is. question of control is interesting in that respect. You know, design's long history with ideas of mastery and control versus, if you like, Web 2.0 or, or, or the proliferation of technology to the extent that um, <clears throat> the surveillance camera formerly was owned by the state and was turned on the crowd, and now the crowd has 
surveillance technologies in their everyday in jeans pocket. Mm -hmm. And the kind of Rodney King, for example, when this black man was beaten up by the police in America, riots, the LA riots occurred as a result. That's because people had in their pockets phones and cameras and things that they could witness it and record it. So um, the state is constantly trying to keep up with the pace of technological change and trying to you know, um, uh, adapt the firewall in China, for example, you know, trying to adapt its sort of state structures to. Uh, but it's almost certainly fighting a losing battle because technology is ahead of legislation. So there is hope. <laughs> Open question. Okay, should we draw the limit? Or... Yeah? Okay, we'll see you tomorrow then. <laughs>